right, we are in Judges, and we had one verse left to cover in chapter 3. Uh, we we're looking at the book of Judges, and we covered Othniel and Ehud last week. And uh, unless anybody has any loose ends from that that they feel like they need to share, we're going to look at Shamgar very briefly. Uh, he only gets one verse devoted to him in Judges chapter 3 and verse 31. After him came Shamgar, the son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad, and he also saved Israel. Um, now, if we're going to give so little information about this guy, why do we bring him up at all? That was a question for the class. So. Uh, I believe it was uh, Bezalel and Aholiab. Let me look. Uh, right. I mentioned a couple times, but yeah. Bezalel and Aholiab. Hmm? Okay, so Shamgar is mentioned later on in Judges chapter 5 and verse 6, right? Um, and that's the song of Deborah and Barak. They were talking about the oppression that happened in the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were deserted, which suggests to us that, you know, maybe, Shamgar, maybe Shamgar's story goes more what comes after than what comes before. Um, so now that's one thought to put in mind. Um, I think that there, that a couple things. The name Shamgar, uh, most people don't know what it means. It's and people debate about what it means. One of the suggestions is that it means wanderer or stranger. Some people think he's a Hittite. Uh, it's of Hittite origin. Uh, son of Anath. Anybody know who Anath was? Any Bible character named Anath? I, I can't think of any offhand. Uh, hmm? um, I don't know. I don't know how you would mistake Anath for Anak in the, um, the Hebrew. but it, it, it doesn't seem like it would be mistaken very easily in Hebrew. There is a Anath in the Canaanite pantheon. Uh, there was a Canaanite war goddess named Anath. It was um, some child of Baal and his consort. Uh, I don't remember all of the details of that. But the suggestion based on that is that Shamgar was not actually an Israelite at all, but rather uh, he was an Egyptian officer who fought Philistines and saved Israel as a result. Um, and, you know, I don't know how specific you can get with information like that, but it would be interesting to me if Shamgar were not an Israelite. He's never called a ruler. He's never called a judge. He's never, you know, there's no mention of his tribal heritage at all. It simply says that he saved Israel. Um, he appears to have been contemporary with Deborah and Barak, uh, but in the song in Judges 5, he's paralleled with Je Yael, the Gentile woman in that story, who is the deliverer. Uh, there's nothing said about a cycle, about an apostasy, about an oppre uh, a specific oppression. There's no time references, there's no rest, there's no reference to the fact that God raised up the deliverer. Mark. But, well, hey, uh, you know, all this stuff seems, Shamgar seems kind of different from the other judges in many ways and out of place. And so the suggestion is, or one of the prevailing suggestions out there right now is that he was not an Israelite at all, but that he was an outsider or a Gentile. Now, I wouldn't, you know, be dogmatic about that and stake my claim on that, but, you know, if he was not an Israelite, what would that mean? All <laughs> patients. Right, okay. I mean, you know, Israel gets saved by an outsider instead of one of their own people. It's proof that God can work through whomever He chooses. Just like in Judges 4, He works through Yael, this Kenite woman who drives a tent spike through Sisera's head. You, you had something you were going to say. Get, yeah. you know. Maybe I could do better at making my Okay. Melchizedek. Where'd he come from? Where'd he go? Who was he? I mean, mm -hmm. I've got my opinion. Really don't know. We have no clue. Mention one place in the Bible. Jesus said, yeah, He was important to God because he did God's will. Hamgar is mentioned here in one other place in the We don't really know much about the guy, but you know what? Huh. 
He was an obscure nobody. He did God's will and God. That's interesting. I, you know, I hadn't thought about comparing him to Melchizedek, but I like that. I'm going to look at that some more and kind of think about what we we'll, what, what we can do with that. Uh, the Shamgar, you know. Furthermore, we look at what he did. He strikes down 600 Philistines with an ox goad. Kind of an odd weapon of choice. Does that sound like anything we're going to see later? Hmm? Yeah, it sounds kind of, yeah, it sounds, it sounds kind of like Samson. Struck down a, a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey in Judges chapter 15 and verses 15 and 16. So, uh, and... And the very last thing it just says is that he also saved Israel. Uh, now there's a lot of what we would call minor judges in the book of Judges, and Shamgar is one of them, you know, which minor judge is a way of saying that he only gets a couple of verses. Uh, but out of all the minor judges, only two of them are said to have saved Israel. Uh, Shamgar and Tola, in Judges chapter 10 and verse 1, are both said to have saved Israel. They were uh, now, Jer, Ibzon, Elon, and Abdon, they all said to have judged Israel, but they didn't necessarily save Israel from anything. Uh, at least not that the text tells us. So, not every judge of Israel was a deliverer. Um, something to think about there. I, that, there's not much else I can think of we could say about Shamgar, but if you've got other points or other observations you want to share, you know, let me know. And if not, we're going to move on to Deborah and Barak. Uh, judges chapter 4. Then the sons of Israel did, again did evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. And the commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harosheth Hagoyim. The sons of Israel cried to the Lord, for he had 900 iron chariots. And he oppressed the sons of Israel severely for 70 years. Well, for 20 years. <laughs> now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the sons of Israel came up to her for judgment. Now she sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kedesh Naphtali, and said to him, Behold, the Lord, the God of Israel, has commanded, Go and march to Mount Tabor, and take with you ten thousand men from the sons of Naphtali and from the sons of Zebulun. I will draw out to you Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his many troops to the river Kishon, and I will give him into your hand. Then Barak said to her, If you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. She said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the honor shall not be yours on the journey that you are about to take, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hands of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali together to Kadesh, and 10,000 men went up with them, and Deborah also went up with him. Alright, so we kind of see the beginning of the story, repeating ourselves a lot. Israel again does evil in the sight of the Lord, just like chapter 3 and verse 7 and in verse 11. Israel is sold into the hand of Jabin, the king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Have we seen this name anywhere before? Jabin, king who reigns in Hazor. I usually don't ask questions like that unless the answer is yes, we have seen this somewhere before. Where have we seen that before? Hmm? Where? Joshua 11, right. Okay, so I mean, this sounds kind of similar to something we read in Joshua 11. There was a guy named Jabin who was king in Hazor. And, you know, of course, there's always some skeptics out there who would say, well, the Judges 4 is just a garbled version of Joshua 11. Um, now, there's solutions to this, of course. Jabin could have been a dynastic name instead of the name of a specific king. Um, but what, do we, what happened to the city of Hazor in Joshua chapter 11? Anybody remember? Did they toilet paper it? Did they decorate it? What did they do with it? They captured it, and what did they do after they captured it? They hamstrung the horses, they burned the chariots. What about the city? Did they inhabit the city? They burned it! <laughs> it's, like one of, it's like one of three cities in the book of Joshua that get burned. Jericho, Ai, and Hazor. Uh, just kind of... I would use actual maps, but our current map stand is broken. I'm not going to say who broke it, Mark, but um, you know, that's a... Uh, 
Well, Hazor would have been located about here. So it's kind of located up in northern Israel. This is the Jordan River, the Dead Sea, the Sea of Kinnereth or Galilee. Uh, but Hazor is way up here in the north. And, you know, what tribes are dominating this? What tribes were supposed to inhabit this area? Hmm? No, a half tribe of Manasseh is over here on the other side of the Jordan. Dan was supposed to be over here in this area. But eventually they migrate north or up here. Uh, but you were right when you said Naphtali. Naphtali and Zebulun are kind of both up here. And they're the ones that get hit the hardest. So they're the ones that kind of take the central place in the battle uh, that's given in this story. So Hazor's up here. And the city that Barak is from, Kadesh, right there. So, you know, they're pretty close by. Um, these are guesstimated locations, by the way, because I don't have a precise cartographical skills. Again, um, <coughs> for, for whatever reason, yeah, I mean, and th that's a point we could probably make from it, you know, is, you know, maybe the, they burned the city of Hazor, but the inhabitants weren't completely destroyed, so Hazor comes back to bite them later uh, and cause more trouble for them. Um, and so th th that's a possibility as well. Uh, now, by the time of King Solomon, in 1 Kings 9.15, Solomon fortifies the city of Hazor as one of his fortresses. Uh, it's listed among the cities that he recruits forced labor to build. Uh, but in any case, what we see here is that we got a, present, a previously defeated king. We thought he was gone, but now he's back. And the city in the narrative that we thought was gone, but now it's back. And it further shows Israel's failure to drive out the Canaanites. Uh, we also see something else that we've seen before in verse 3. Judges 4, verse 3. For those joining us, we're in Judges 4 this morning. Uh. Hmm? Chariots? What kind of chariots? Iron chariots. Where have we seen that before? Israel have a good history with iron chariots? Judges chapter 1, that's right. Yeah, remember uh, in verse 19, the Lord was with Judah and they took possession of the hill country, but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had iron chariots. And, you know, that verse has perplexed people and going, wait a second, how did Israel lose a battle against iron chariots is God, if God was with them? Are iron chariots stronger than God is? Well, we are going to read the battle in Judges 4. That's clearly not the case because God wins this battle for them. You know, so the problem is not God, the problem is ultimately Israel and their, uh, their own, for whatever reason, their unstated lack of will. Uh, Judges 1 is very purposeful about not making value judgments and just kind of pointing out the what happened rather than the, you know, what, what it happened means. Um, so there's no explanation of it, but it practically begs the question, as I said before, that uh, why did Israel lose to iron chariots? Well, God was with them, but it would not have been necessarily for good. Uh, 20 years of oppression, uh, probably focused on the northern tribes. But essentially what we've got here is the situation where those iron chariots that defeated you in chapter 1, this is kind of a chance to get rid of them. Uh, this is kind of a chance to deal with that problem. And then in verses 4 through 10, what, if, if we've been paying attention in Judges so far, Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. The Lord sold them in the hands of X oppressor. Israel cried out to the Lord. What's the next thing that usually happens? Right. God raises up a deliverer. Uh, he causes a deliverer to rise. Uh, right? So that's the next thing we expect, right? That's not what we read next. What we read next is there was this prophetess named Deborah who was judging Israel at that time, and she was judging Israel under a palm tree near Bethel and Ramah. Um, just to kind of I can't remember precisely where Bethel is, but it's somewhere around here. Uh, so, you know, she's actually kind of a ways away from all of this oppression that's taking place. She's in the tribe of Ephraim, and in that area, that territory. Um, but she's the wife of Lapidoth. How many of you knew that the name of Deborah's husband? That's one of those fun trivia questions to throw out there. Um, some people actually suggest that Barak and Lapidoth were the same person because the name Barak means lightning and the name Lapidoth means torches or flashes. 
I don't really buy that, but especially since they're from two completely different tribes, that kind of derails that idea, but mention it because that idea is out there. Um, and what, what, do we, what do we do with all this, though? Uh, Deborah is, well, she's a prophetess. And the, what, are the, what, are the, what is she doing? I and mean, what is her role in the story? She's judging. Okay. Right. Yeah, I think we need to be careful. Uh, sometimes when, when the book of Judges says judge, it's, you know, we, we get this image in our mind because of the culture we live in of this you know, guy in a courtroom in a black robe with a gavel that just kind of makes decisions and tells people you're right, you're wrong, you pay this much, you go to jail for this amount of time. That really wasn't what a judge is anywhere in the book of Judges. And you know, maybe Deborah is the closest thing you get to that, but uh, maybe not even then. Maybe what you've got here is since she's a prophetess, she's someone they go to, to simply inquire of God. And similar to how Samuel judges Israel in the capacity of a prophet later on in 1 Samuel chapter 7. Uh, so what's maybe really going on here is that instead of the sons of Israel gathering to Shiloh to inquire of God by Urim and Thummim, what we've got is a situation where you know, the leadership has become so bankrupt, the priesthood has become so corrupt, we've got to consult somebody else. And so they go and they consult the prophetess Deborah instead. Um, Yes. Also, Judge, Well, I mean, you know, that that prob that's probably true, and you know, there there is some significance to the fact that Deborah is a woman. She's the only woman we know of in the Bible that really act in this kind of capacity as like a prophetess and a judge and a leader and all of those types of things. Uh, you know, you'll see other prophetesses on occasion in the Bible like Huldah or uh, you know, in Luke chapter 2, Anna or Miriam, the sister of Aaron. Um, but, you know, what, what do we do with all of this? Uh, what is Deborah's main function appears to be someone whom the people can consult for the word of God. Instead of going up to Shiloh, they go up to the palm tree of Deborah. And she's sort of this alternate means of consulting God. But what would her, the fact that she has to be the leader, what does that say about the rest of Israel? Hmm? The priesthood's not doing their job? Okay. Mark said they're very sorry leadership. You know, Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12, talks about you know, how one of the curses... Uh, we come on the nation, you know, my people, you know, they become like children and women are ruling over them. Well, because there's no male leadership to, you know, run things anymore. Uh, and so what we have, you know, there's a lot of things that are not said about Deborah in the story. It's never mentioned that God raised her up. It's never mentioned that she had the spirit, although I think that's implied by the fact that she's a prophetess. Um, she's never, you know, she goes and she recruits Barak. She has to drag Barak into battle, kicking and screaming practically, to get things done. Uh... Maybe I'm exaggerating there a little bit. And, you know, here, here's another interesting factoid. She's never a, in any of the lists of deliverers in the Bible, you know, where they're listing off judges like Gideon and Jephthah and Samson. Deborah's name never appears on any of those lists. Even in Hebrews 11. You know, you, you read those, that list of heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. You know, and he mentions Barak, who was a total coward, but he doesn't mention Deborah. You know, I've always thought that was odd and strange and, you know, Maybe, yeah, maybe. Um, and yet, I mean, it, what we're seeing in the book of Judges is that even though Deb, nothing bad is said about Deborah in the story, she's kind of like you know the Othniel of women, I guess. But she's not the judge in the. Well, she's not the deliverer in the story. The deliverer in the story is Barak, and like all the other deliverers from Ehud onwards, we've got kind of an anti-hero thing going on. From Ehud, the left-handed man who stabs. Kings in the belly, Gideon, who doesn't want to do it, and eventually sets up an idol, Jephthah, who sacrifices his daughter, Samson, who, well, I'm not even going to start on Samson. 
all, all these guys are kind of like anti-heroes. They're doing the right thing, but they're also doing a bunch of bad stuff on the side, and they're not really very good people when you really look at them. And so Barak is kind of like that, and Deborah is kind of the good, you know, the conscience that kind of goads them into battle. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, she's the helper even in spite of his... But she's not really his husband. Well, she's not really his wife, I guess. But she is kind of doing what women have always been supposed to do in spite of males completely failing to do their job. Uh, you know, she has to sort of goad him into this. Um, Deborah recruits Barak to lead the military. And he's from Kadesh Naphtali. I already pointed out where that was on the map. Uh, she gives him a message from God acting as a prophetess. He's supposed to recruit an army from Zebulun and Naphtali, those two tribes that are being completely oppressed. And she says, I will, I will draw out you Sisera. That's God's promise, not hers. God is the one who will direct Sisera in battle. He is the one who will lead Sisera to his total destruction. And Barak, you know, he's, he's up and at him, right? He wants to go do this, right? Not really, no. Why? Sure, I'll go out to battle, but you go with me. I need you to help me. I mean, women don't really belong on the battlefield in the ancient world at all. And yet here's that very case going on. Oh, I'll go out to battle if you come with me. It's kind of like, what? Uh, this is similar to the hesitation that we find when Moses was called or when Gideon is called in chapter 6. Uh, Deborah's response is, okay, fine. But since you're not comfortable fighting without a woman, a woman is going to get the credit for winning this battle. That's what's going to happen. And, you know, if we're the reader and we don't know how the story ends, we might think, oh, Deborah's going to be that woman. But it's not. It's a completely different woman. It's a Gentile woman who's not even an Israelite. Uh, they get this army of... So in verse 10, we have this army of 10,000 men and one Deborah. Uh, so there's that kind of... I think we are supposed to kind of get a chuckle out of this because the ancient story is kind of poking fun at you know, the, the bad behavior of Barak here. The whole story is told with a wink. Um... Any comments or questions down to verse 10 before we get into the battle proper? Verse 11. And Heber the Kenite separated himself from the Kenites, from the sons of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, and had pitched his tent as far away as the oak in Za'ananim. Za'ananim. Yes, that's right. Za'ananim, which is near Kedesh. Uh, first of all, well, why, why bring this up? Who's this guy? Heber. We've seen him before. Eber the Kenite? We saw him earlier in Judges. <laughs> well, we saw the Kenite earlier in Judges, I should say. Remember back in Judges 1.16, the descendants of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up from the city of Palms with the sons of Judah to the wilderness of Judah, which is in the south of Arad, and they went and lived with the people. So basically what it is, is the Kenites, Moses' kind of in-law family, had been traveling with Israel in the wilderness. They joined with them in the Promised Land, and they kind of settled with them. But out of all these Kenites, there's this guy named Heber the Kenite, who decides, you know, I'm going to pitch my tent a little more in the northerly direction, uh, near Kadesh, up there near Hazor, which we looked at. And in fact, we get information later on, in verse 17, that there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber the Kenite. So what we got here is a Kenite man who's not really on Israel's side. He's on the Canaanites' side now. He's kind of joined forces with them. And he's made peace with the king of Hazor. You know, he's, for whatever reason, maybe he's just playing favorites with whoever he thinks is going to win on this particular occasion. But that's, you know, verse 11 kind of drops a piece of information that explains what we're reading later on. Verse 12, they told Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor. Sisera called together all his chariots, 900 iron chariots, and all the people who were with him, from Harashat Hagayim to the river Kishon. Deborah said to Barak, Arise, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Behold, the Lord has gone out before you. So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. The Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak, and Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and the army as far as Harashat Hagoyim, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not even one was left. Now, that was a pretty quick battle. God gives 
Sisera into Barak's hands, which the fact that they beat the Iron Chariots tells us something, that whatever happened in Judges 1 when they lost to the Iron Chariots, it wasn't God's fault. Here God's presence grants victory over the Iron Chariots. Sisera's company is routed. Sisera is a force to abandon his chariot, that thing that he relied on so much for his victories, and he flees away on foot. The great Canaanite general reduced to a lowly foot soldier. And Barak utterly destroys Sisera's army. Not even one is left. But what about Sisera? Surely he can really, um, route another army, right? Well, no. Oh, what's going to happen? It will muster another army, I should say. In verse 17, Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Yael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael went out to meet Sisera, and she said to him, Turn aside, my master, turn aside to me, do not be afraid. He turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. He said to her, Please, give me a little water to drink, for I'm thirsty. So she opened a bottle of milk and gave him a drink. And then she covered him. He said to her, Stand in the doorway of the tent, and it shall be if anyone comes and inquires of you and says, Is there anyone here? You shall say, No. But Yael, Heber's wife, took a tent peg and seized a hammer in her hand and went secretly to him and drove the peg into his temple. And it went through into the ground, for he was sound asleep and exhausted. So he died. And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Yael came out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. He entered with her, and behold, Sisera was lying dead with the tent peg in his temple. So God subdued on that day Jabin the king of Canaan before the sons of Israel. The hand of the sons of Israel pressed heavier and heavier upon Jabin the king of Canaan until they had destroyed Jabin the king of Canaan. Alright, so what we have here is that peace that exists between Heber and Jabin. Sisera decides to take advantage of that. He goes into the tent and Jael gives him milk to drink instead of water. Uh, maybe she thought it would make for healthy bones and teeth. I don't know, but he goes to sleep, and yeah, 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 that's true. It's uh, probably his, you know, go, go to sleep now. Here's some warm milk. Enjoy yourself. And while he's sleeping, she assassinates him in a way that the text describes in a very graphic and gruesome fashion. Uh, drives him with, you know, punctures his skull with a tent spike. Um, just a couple of points here. First of all. You know, Sisera goes in, he instructs her, don't tell anyone I'm here. What does that remind us of? Anything we've read in the Bible before? Hiding out in someone's tent and saying, don't tell anybody I'm here. Okay, yeah. Right? Now that ends a little differently though. Now, here we got kind of a role reversal. The Canaanite fleeing from the enemy and hiding in the house of Yael and don't tell anyone I'm here and well I mean she does tell everybody that he's there. She says in verse 22, here, he's in here, he's in here. You go in and they find him dead of course which is adds another layer of uh, irony on top of the already very thick cake. Uh, Sisera goes to sleep and Yael kills him and she doesn't do, and afterwards she didn't even do what he said. She sold him out to Barak as soon as he came by. You know, you kind of got that comment in the story after the fact. Um, but also, the discovery of his body and his gruesome assassination, that remind us of anything? Judges likes to throw things like this at us. I haven't thought of Jesus, but that's interesting. Uh, no, I know what you're saying. We're, we're going to talk about that. Uh, I think we're going to talk about that later today in the sermon. I forget if that's in the passage of Luke we're in today. Uh, but, they drive us. Probably. It is. It is stretching, but I'm not going to just miss it right away. I'm going to think about it first. I, I, yeah, that, that, that's more where I was going with it. But, but I'm, I'm going to think about that and get back to you. I, I, I don't, you know. That was the first day of possible. Yeah. I'm going to think about that, that, that. That was different. I hadn't thought of that. But he does always say, that's true. That's true. So if you didn't know the answer, I mean, J James is learning, guys. He's learning. You, you say Jesus when you don't know what the answer is. It's almost always that. 
but in this case, you know, it, Mark, Mark brings up uh, Ehud and Eglon, which was more of an immediate thing. I was just kind of saying, what does this remind us of from last week? Uh, um, I should have been more specific. <laughs> It's like, here, yeah, this, is, this is Bible class. Read, read the teacher's mind and, you know, extra credit goes to whoever can do that, right? No, that's horrible. Um, that's not how you're supposed to teach. In Judges 3, yes, Eglon, in Judges 3, here's what is interesting. Eglon's servants discover the dead body of, an, of the, their ruler, their leader, that the Israelite has just killed by an Israelite weapon. In Judges 4, it's Israelites who discover the body of the, of the enemy leader, and he's dead from one of the supposed servants. You see how they kind of role reversed in that story? Very subtle. But they, they switched roles in the story. It was the Israelite assassin in the first one. Now it's, a, now it's more of a, one of his servants that kills him. And it's the servants that discovered the body in the first story, but now it's the Israelites who have to come in and find the body after the fact. You know, now, in chapter 3, the servants who, who find the body are displayed as in rather oafish, clumsy, incompetent, they don't know what they're doing. Oh, maybe he's relieving himself. Well, you know, he's been in there a while. Maybe we should check on him. They check on him and he's dead. You know, they're just incompetent, clumsy. Now it's the other way around. Barak is the one who, you know, he's only winning because God's giving him the victory. But he himself is kind of fumbling around here. Uh, you know, God gives him the victory, not because of who he is, but because the nation has cried to help. Um, but why, why would we reverse the roles like that? <laughs> God can save by whomever he chooses. Okay, so there's a commentary on who God is. What about the nation? What does it say about the nation? Again, they're not doing their job. You see how Israel, the, the fact that Israel's role switches with the Canaanites like that, very subtle way of saying that the nation is being Canaanized. Very subtle way of saying how the nation is succumbing to all of this Canaanite idolatry that's just, you know overtaken them and pervaded them and you know they really are becoming a snare to them and thorns in their sides and pricks in their eyes they're becoming more like the nations around whom they live now this is again subtle and it gets more explicit as we go throughout the book of judges but it's interesting to note that here there's a lot a lot of points more points we can make from judges 4 i'm just going to stop here and ask any comments or questions jenna you have something Oh, we, we, we don't permit humor in this class. I'm sorry, that's uh, not allowed. I mean, you know what you're doing with a hammer. You can probably impale some... I don't know. I've never really... I haven't spent a lot of time experimenting with driving tent spikes through people's skulls. So I don't know how much force that takes. <laughs> That's true. That's true. It was the job of women to set up tents. That's true. Okay. I... Not, not that I'm aware of. I've never encountered one. I mean, as far as I know, that the, uh, the gift... I don't know anybody with the gift of prophecy today. The scripture talks about how that, you know, gifts of prophecy would cease in 1 Corinthians 13. And, um, you know, I mean, you know, every claimed prophet or prophetess out there today doesn't have a very good track record for being right about things. Uh, you know, I mean, Deuteronomy 18 says that if somebody is a prophet, or they claim to be a prophet, and they predict something, and it doesn't come true, then they're not a prophet, they're lying. You know, so you need a 100% predictive success rate in order to be a prophet. Um, and that's, in that respect, now I don't know of anybody who's a prophet or prophetess today. Yes, Tom? Presumably, I mean, uh, a prophet, the definition of a prophet, you, know, you go to exit, and I'm assuming the prophetess is the same thing as a prophet, just female, but uh, the definition of a prophet is mainly given in Exodus chapter 7. Um, a prophet was just a spokesperson for God. Sometimes we get it in our heads that, you know, all prophets did was, you know, tell the future. That's not really strictly true. They could tell the future. 
But they were more foretellers than foretellers. Uh, and in Exodus chapter 7, God makes an analogy. He says that, I will make you Moses, I will make you as God to Pharaoh, and your son and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. He will be your spokesperson. You know, so Aaron would speak for Moses to Pharaoh, and Moses would be like God in that relationship. That's kind of what a prophet was. That, that you have God, and you have this people that God wants to speak to. Then you have the prophet. The prophet is like a spokesperson. He's like the, mouth per, the mouthpiece of sorts. He's like a messenger. You know, you get this picture of a king sending envoys or messengers to, the nation, to another nation. The prophet was that envoy or messenger. And many of his messages always started with the phrase, Thus says the Lord. This is what the Lord says. That was the job of a prophet or a prophetess in Israel. Now, we don't learn anything about any prophecies that Deborah made on this particular occasion. Um, she was just a person who came... Well, except for the comment here in verse 6 of chapter 4. Behold, the Lord, the God of Israel, has commanded, go and do this. And everything else she gives is a message from God. That's the job of a prophetess. Gail. We have not gotten into the song of victory in chapter 5. Um, I should just say right now, Judges 5 basically tells the same story, but this time in poetry. Uh, this was a song that they sang uh, in response to the victory. We had this same kind of pairing in Exodus 14 and 15. Israel crosses the Red Sea in Exodus 14. Exodus 15 is a song about Israel crossing the Red Sea. But what I find interesting about all of this is in Judges chapter 5 and in verse 24... Most blessed of women is Yael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. Most blessed is she of women in the tent. Now there's only two people in the entire Bible about whom that's said. Most blessed among women is she. Yael is one. Who's the other one? You already know this because I told you. <laughs> Who's the other one? Anybody know? Mary, yes. Most blessed among women is Mary. Uh, which means that whenever they say that, you know, they're kind of alluding back to this passage of Judges of all things. Um... I find it very interesting that you know the, Mary is compared to Yael on that particular occasion. Um, we do not have time to read this song. Uh, so your assignment for next time is to read Judges chapter 5. And uh, we probably won't spend the whole class on it. I want to get into Gideon and uh, next time and look at more of what he did. But read Judges chapter 5 and just you know note, note some differences between that and Judges 4. Some new information it adds. Some information maybe it doesn't add. Uh, you know, the interesting things about the roll calls of the tribes and making fun of Sisera's mother and all the other things in this song that uh, make it such a joy to read. Thank you all for the good discussion. <laughs>